we welcome you to the sermon today. If you'd like to follow along, please turn to 1 Kings 22 and verses 1 to 28. The lesson is titled, That I Will Speak. Sometimes today you will hear people tell others to fight the good fight. People commonly use this idiom today in the following ways, such as to try very hard to do what is right or to act in a way that's virtuous or honorable. And so you might hear someone say, fight the good fight. Where did this expression come from? We see from 1 Timothy chapter 6, 11 to 12, that originally Paul wrote these words to Timothy, encouraging him to obey and to proclaim the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 11 to 12, he describes some who had left the faith or those who did not speak the truth of the faith. There were some things that they did that were wrong. He said, but you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so as a man of God, he was to flee these things of sin and instead pursue these things of God, including righteousness or doing the things that are right in the sight of God, godliness. And so his devotion to the Lord, his devoutness, his piety. Third, his faith. And so the faith of Timothy and following the faith of Christ. Love. And so such as loving God with all of one's heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Patience. Perseverance. Long-suffering. And finally, gentleness or meekness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. And so the fight in this sense is that of not only proclaiming the word of God, the will of the Lord, but following that word. Timothy had confessed the good confession of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Compare the words, fight the good fight, with confess the good confession. And so this gives you a good idea about what he meant. Fight the good fight, confess the good confession, qualified by of faith. And so in preaching and in obeying the word of faith. As Christians, we certainly should follow the teachings of Christ, and particularly as preachers, that we preach the word, the gospel of Christ, and continue to set a good example for others to follow. Paul encouraged Timothy to continue to follow in the faith and to speak the word of Christ. We today begin with a story of a prophet, a prophet of the Lord, by the name of Micaiah. And so we'll, we'll look at Micaiah, the prophet, today from 1 Kings 22, 1 through 28. The prophet. The word prophet describes someone who was a spokesman, someone who would speak the word of another. And so a prophet of the Lord was to be someone who would speak the word of the Lord. Again, if you haven't already, turn to 1 Kings 22, 1 to 28, and we'll look at this verse by verse. Before we begin, note a, a bit of background. Following the death of Solomon, during the days of Rehoboam, his son, the kingdom of Israel was divided. 
The northern king, kingdom under the rebellious Jeroboam retained the name Israel. The southern kingdom under Solomon's son Rehoboam became known as Judah. Our focus today will be on a portion of the record that occurred during the reigns of Ahab, the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. While Jehoshaphat generally did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, he was allied with Ahab, who did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so you can have a, a brief evaluation of each of these two kings, 1 Kings 22 and 43, and also 1 Kings 16 and 30. You might remember that Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, and they both were evil. What would it have been like to serve and worship the Lord during the reign of Ahab? To get a, a brief idea, look at 1 Kings 16, 32 to 33. Speaking of Ahab, then he set up an altar for Baal and the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Can you imagine? Think about the prophets who would serve during his reign. We're going to look at one particular prophet today. What would it be like to be a prophet of the Lord in the kingdom of Israel with Ahab as king? 1 Kings 22 and verse 1. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. The three years refers to the time following the treaty between Ben-Hadad and Ahab. However, Ben-Hadad had not honored the treaty. And instead, he retained the cities that he had promised to restore to Israel. This treaty is described in 1 Kings 20 in verse 34. So Ben-Hadad said to him, The cities which my father took from your father I will restore, and you may set up marketplaces for yourself in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. Then Ahab said, I will send you away with this treaty. So he made a treaty with him and sent him away. However, he did not honor the treaty. Verse 2, then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down from Jerusalem to visit Ahab, the king of Israel. By the words went down, we're, we're speaking of elevation. He went down in elevation the mountain of Jerusalem, and so he went down in that fashion. The kingdom at this time, the kingdom of Israel, was to the north, the kingdom of Judah to the south. And so Jehoshaphat went down from Jerusalem to visit Ahab. We see this also in Second Chronicles 18 and 2. After some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with him. And so we see that one king visit, visited the other. We have Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat visiting Ahab. And Ahab preparing food for them to eat in a banquet. A banquet for the visiting king, Jehoshaphat, but also for both the people who attended him all those who were with him. Verse 3, And the kingdom of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? And so Ramoth in Gilead was one of those cities that Ben-Hadad of Syria had promised to restore to Israel. While Ramoth Gilead rightly belonged to Israel, 
Ben Hadad still had possession of the city. And so here you have Ahab speaking to Jehoshaphat. Do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it? So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And so Ahab, the king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, for aid in fighting Syria for Ramoth Gilead. Ahab persuaded Jehoshaphat to go up with him to this city of Ramoth Gilead in 2 Chronicles 18 and 2. In verse 3, I am as you are, and my people as your people. We will be with you in the war. And so we see that Jehoshaphat was very compliant and, and agreeing to this pursuit to go to the city to fight and to take the city back. Why did Jehoshaphat agree to aid Ahab? Second Chronicles 18.1 gives us a clue. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. And by marriage, he allied himself with Ahab. And so we have an indication here of the allegiance between the two, particularly in this case by marriage. Verse 5. Also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. And so Jehoshaphat suggested that Ahab ask for the word of the Lord. If he was going to do as he said he would do and go with Ahab to fight for the city, he first wanted to make inquiry of the Lord. And so what is the word of the Lord today? He wanted the inquiry to be made today before they went to fight, not tomorrow, not sometime in the future, not afterwards, but today, before they departed. He did not wish to delay. This gives you an indication between the, the faith of, of the two kings. Again, while Jehoshaphat was generally a good king, Ahab was not. And to Jehoshaphat, the word of the Lord was important. And so he asked for the word of the Lord to be brought before him. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And so Ahab gathered the prophets together, who were about 400 men. And he inquired as to whether he should go to fight or refrain. The prophets said, to go, for the Lord would deliver the city to him, to Ahab. And so he begins by gathering together all of these many prophets, about 400 men of his own, to give him the word. And in this case, they said, go up, for the Lord will deliver it into, your, into the hand of the king. Verse 7, and Jehoshaphat said, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Something was amiss. Jehoshaphat wanted a prophet of the Lord before them so that they could inquire of him. Apparently, he was not satisfied with the prophets called by Ahab who claimed to speak for the Lord or claimed to speak for God. 1 Kings 22 and 6, 2 Chronicles 18 and 5. Verse 8, so the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. 
but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Was there still a prophet of the Lord? Ahab grudgingly mentioned that there was still Micaiah, Micaiah who, by whom they could inquire of the Lord. And so if he wanted a prophet of the Lord, yes, there was still, there was one available. We would have to go get him. But what about these 400? Well, Jehoshaphat wanted a prophet of the Lord. And so Ahab grudgingly suggests Micaiah, who could inquire the Lord for them. However, Ahab said that he hates Micaiah. Second Chronicles 18 and 7, because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. I'm sure that wasn't true. And if you read the record, it was not. <laughs> However, it's often the case that one only hears what he wants to hear or does not hear what he does not want to hear. Jehoshaphat rebuked Ahab that they should not hate the prophet nor his message because he does not prophesy in a favorable way. And so it's, it's something similar to, to killing the messenger. In this case here, this prophet that he hated was a prophet of the Lord. And as long as he spoke the word of the Lord, then he was doing his work. He was doing his, his, his job as a prophet. And so Jehoshaphat says, you ought not to say such a thing. Again, we can see the difference in the faith between the two kings. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imla, quickly. And so Ahab ordered, I think very reluctantly, that an officer bring Micaiah to them quickly. And so let's do this. Let's get it done. Bring the man here so that we can go to the city and, and take it back. That seems to be the attitude of the, of the man. Ahab. It appears that Micaiah at this time was in prison. Whatever for? Well, I think we have an indication of the kind of man that would have him put into prison. First Kings 22, 25 to 26. We'll see later how that this is where he was and this is where he would later send him back. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. It'd be some time before Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord, could be brought by the officer and sent by the messenger back to speak the word of the Lord for the kings. And so while the the kings waited for Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord. The other prophets prophesied. Can you imagine about 400 of these men prophesying before the king? Now Zechariah, the son of Kaniah, had made the horns of iron for himself. And he said, thus says the Lord. With these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. Early the prophets said in 1 Kings 22 and 6, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Zedekiah even used horns of iron for demonstration, which these horns symbolized strength in order to show how Ahab would destroy the Syrians, this time speaking by the name of the Lord. And so here he even brings in some uh, items to demonstrate just how their word was true and that he ought to, to heed their encouragement that he could go 
and, and win the fight. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him and saying, now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. Earlier, Ahab called an officer to bring Micaiah quickly, back in verse 9. The messenger spoke to Micaiah. What did he say? Well, this messenger of, of Ahab told Micaiah how all the prophets encouraged Ahab. Again, remember, about 400 men prophesying before him, saying how that he ought to go up. He can go up and come back in peace. He told him, too, that he ought to agree with them and do as they did and speak encouragement before Ahab. What about the truth? Did the truth matter to the messenger? It does not appear so. He was probably more concerned with his life. Did the truth matter to Jehoshaphat, it appears that the, the king wanted to hear the word of the Lord. But what about Ahab? No. No, just as the messenger nor Ahab seemed to really care about the truth, each for a different reason. The messenger spoke to Micaiah and he told him, you ought to speak just the way the other 400 speak. Of course, the 400 were under on the payroll of the king, King Ahab, they were working for him. And they said what he wanted them to say. And so, Micaiah, you should do the same. What would he do? It reminds us of, of Daniel, the prophet. It reminds us of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of how and other prophets of the Lord, other people of the Lord, how that they were told to do something. And sometimes it was contrary to, to what was right. I think about uh, James and Peter and John and how they were told not to speak in the name of the Lord. And how Peter said it's better to, it is better to obey God than man. And he went on and continued to preach the name of Jesus Christ. Well, here you have the messenger telling Micaiah. For him to do what all the other people did, all the other prophets, and speak encouragement. Of course, they were not true prophets. Verse 14, and Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. And so the prophet answered the messenger. He swore before God that whatever the Lord revealed to him, he would speak to Ahab, good or bad. Second Chronicles 18, 13, and Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that I will speak. And so Micaiah was determined to speak the word of the Lord, whether Ahab loved him or hated him, thought his message was good or evil, thought his words were encouraging or not. As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. This is a good position for preachers to take today. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war with Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? The prophet Micaiah came before Ahab, who sat on the throne. Earlier, Ahab had asked his prophets, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain from fighting? Ahab asked the same question to Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord. We know what he wanted to hear, but would he hear it? We also know what Micaiah had told the messenger what he would say. But would he say it? What would the word of the Lord be? Verse 15, and he answered him, 
go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. All the prophets said to Ahab the king, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand into the king's hands. 1 Kings 22 and 12. Now, Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord, answered in the same way as did all the prophets, just as the messenger and the king wanted him to do. He did. 1 Kings 22 and 13. However, Micaiah said these words with irony. He meant the opposite. And there was something in his voice, something in what he said or how he said it, that indicated that he spoke ironically to the king. Verse 16, so the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Ahab, by his previous experiences, sensed something in what Micaiah said or how he said it. He would make Micaiah swear that he told him nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord. Did he really want the truth and nothing but the truth? Sometimes people say that today. I swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. In this case here, I really don't think he was interested in the truth, but he was interested in being told what he wanted to hear. With the case of Micaiah, he told him what he wanted to hear, but he certainly didn't mean it, or he didn't say it in the way that he, that would indicate that he was sincere. Instead, he spoke with irony, and the king picked up on it. And so he tells Micaiah to swear before him to tell nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord. Verse 17, then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. Ahab said he wanted the truth, nothing but the truth. And that's what he received. Micaiah spoke how Israel would be scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. Ahab would fall in battle, and the people of Israel would return home defeated. Micaiah spoke similar words, as did Moses. Numbers 27, 15 to 17. Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of, all, of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. It would be difficult for Ahab to misunderstand what the prophet Micaiah spoke in the name of the Lord. He said back in verse 17, that he saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. He said, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Now that he told, told the king the truth, nothing but the truth, he told him the word of the Lord, he wasn't satisfied with that either. Yes, Ahab had told Jehoshaphat that Micaiah would not prophesy good concerning him. Ahab also told Jehoshaphat how he hated Micaiah back in 1 Kings 22 and verse 8. What would he do? Ahab would not hear the prophecy. And so Micaiah, the prophet, told the word of the Lord in a vision. Let's read this together. Verses 19 to 22. Verse 19, Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by, on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? 
So one spoke in this man manner, and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. The vision of Micaiah, the prophet, revealed the following. Ahab would allow someone to persuade him. And while his prophets encouraged him to go up to war, the prophets of the Lord warned him that he would fall at Ramoth Gilead. As Ahab was determined to go, he listened to the lying prophets and he would fall. In this vision, we see symbolic language and we see how that the point of the message is the same as the prophecy that Micaiah spoke earlier, that the king would fall. And so at the end of the vision, after the vision, he says, Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. How did the Lord put a lying spirit in their mouth? only in the sense that he permitted them to lie, to claim to speak as prophets, but instead speak falsely. And we see that this man, Ahab, who, was, who rebelled against the Lord, who spoke against him, was ready to, to turn against him at every occasion. And so he listened to the voice of these lying prophets and who told him what he wanted to hear, who encouraged him to go, and he disregarded what the prophet of the Lord said. God had sent his prophet Micaiah and he disregarded him. He was content and he was ready to rebel and to continue to turn from him and we see that he would fall. Verse 23, now Zechariah Ze uh, Zedekiah, the son of Kenah, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? After hearing the vision of Micaiah saying that the prophets were liars, Zedekiah struck Micaiah the prophet. If you cannot, if you cannot reason with someone, then so is, does that give you permission to, to act violently towards him? No. Uh, this, this man had, had lost the argument, and now he struck out against the prophet of the Lord. It may have been that Zedekiah was uh, hitting a man who was bound. Micaiah had come from prison, and he would return. And now he struck him on the cheek. Well, Zedekiah claimed that he himself was the true prophet, when in fact they were the lying prophets. And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. Micaiah said that Zedekiah would see for himself who was the false prophet when he heard of Ahab's death. On that day when news of the fall of Ahab reached him in Samaria, Zedekiah would try to find some place to hide. And so they would be found to be liars, lying prophets, because their prophecy of the king would prove to be untrue. And so he, he said, you'll find out who's the true prophet in that day when you hear that he, the king has fallen and you go to try to find some place to hide. Verse 25, so the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And so Ahab ordered for Micaiah to be returned to the custody of Ammon and Joash. He appears to have been there before being called by Ahab, 1 Kings 22. 
and 8. Verse 26, and Ahab said, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I return in peace. Ahab ordered for Micaiah to be returned to prison from where he came and given bread and water sparingly. They were to do so until he returned safely from the war in Ramoth Gilead. Of course, uh, you have 400, about 400 prophets telling you you'll be okay. But the prophet of the Lord says that he would fall. Who would he listen to? He would listen to his own prophets. Would he return home safely? Verse 27, but Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed all you people. Micaiah said by the Lord that Ahab would fall. He would not return to his house in peace. And he calls for all the people to listen as witnesses to the word of the Lord. This story that we see from the history book of Kings tells of a prophet who boldly spoke the word of the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in the New Testament, we have the preacher, we have Timothy, and we have Paul. Paul writing to Timothy to continue to preach the word. Paul charged Timothy, wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience. He was not speaking of a literal war or a literal fight, but the idea that he continue to preach the word and to follow the word. Wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience. Timothy is a preacher. The word was to follow the faith and not allow his conscience to be defiled by acting contrary to the faith of Christ. What about Micaiah, the prophet? What would have happened to him if he would have did just as Ahab wanted him to do? Well, Ahab would have been dead, but what about the prophet? What of his conscience? Would it trouble him? I think so. It would have troubled the prophet of the Lord to speak something contrary to what the Lord had told him to speak. Regrettably, by rejecting this message, some were made shipwreck of the faith. And so he urged Timothy to continue on preaching the word. Paul taught Timothy to teach faithful men who could in turn teach others. 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 7, he used various metaphors for the Christian life and his work as a preacher. He said, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Fight the good fight of faith. And here he uses again this metaphor of a, of a soldier, of Jesus Christ. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We might ask, who are we trying to please? Are we trying to please Christ? Or are we trying to please others? There were some who did not teach the words of Christ and who strayed from the faith of Christ. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 12, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so preach the word. And in so doing and living according to the word, you lay hold on eternal life. You were called to eternal life. And so confess the good confession. Fight the good fight of faith. Timothy had done so in the presence of many witnesses. 
As a preacher, Timothy's work was to preach. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, he said, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And so preach the word. One preacher said, preach it when they want it, when they want to hear it, and when they don't want to hear it, when they like it, and when they don't like it. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering, patience, and doctrine of teaching. However, some would not endure sound, wholesome doctrine, teaching of Christ. Second Timothy 4, 3 to 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Some would be more interested in, in hearing fables than to hear the truth of God's word. Some would rather obtain their own people to preach what they wanted to hear preached than to hear the word of God. And so they would turn aside from the truth and they would turn instead to what they wanted to hear. However, Timothy was to endure. He said, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. What is the work of the evangelist? Preach the gospel, preach the word. His ministry, his service was in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was near the end of his life and ministry when he wrote 2 Timothy 4. And in verses 6 to 7, he said, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Paul has spoken of the Christian life and preaching the gospel of Christ and living according to that gospel as the good fight, as a race. And in this case here, he describes it as the good fight and the race and saying, I have kept the faith. As such, there was a reward. However, the reward was not simply to Paul, who was ready to, to go on to meet the Lord. The reward was for everybody who believed and obeyed the gospel. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved, have loved his appearing. People of God, remember what was said by Micaiah, the prophet of the Lord. In 1 Kings 22, 14, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. The prophet would be judged accordingly by the Lord. As Christians today, let us be content with what the Lord has said, teaching and practicing what is authorized by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say to do? In Colossians 3, 17, after teaching the people to sing and worship of God, he says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. We would be wise today as Christians to be content with hearing the word of the Lord. As preachers, whatever the Lord says in his word, that word we speak. And as believers, that whatever the Lord has said for me to do, as a Christian in his word, that I will do. Whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you do in teaching or practice, do so by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that the sermon today has been edifying and that you would continue to study and to seek the approval of the Lord. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, 
He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Trust the Lord. If you are not a Christian, consider becoming a Christian today. Confess your faith before God. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be baptized for remission of your sins. Acts 2 and 38. Think about these things. If you're a Christian, but you've been unfaithful, repent and go to God in prayer. We're glad that you were here today, and we invite you to return whenever you're able to in the future. Thank you again.